Rita Zavada. I'm the director for institutional audits. Usually there's a groan, yeah. <laughs> but I'm currently working on implementing the new quality assurance framework. Um, my task is easy, I've just got to manage this group. Um, starting with my boss, the CEO, Dr. Whitfield Green, on the far side, and then uh, Dr. Sonia Lewitz and Professor Francois Stradon from the University of the Free State, and Dr. Charles Shepard from NMU. Um, this presentation by the CHE actually forms a very nice bridge between the keynote of this morning that gave us that national picture and the, the sort of institutional snapshots that we got. It, it looks at the higher education sector as a whole. So um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Green. Oh, before, just before, just, we're just going to do it in this way. Um, Dr. Green is going to start, then Charles is going to talk to the numbers, which we know he does very well, and then Francois and Sonia will talk to the, the narrative, which they also do very well, and then Dr. Green will finish, um, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers. Dr. Green? Am I audible? Thank, thank you very much, Peter, and um, hopefully the CHE is exciting um, and, and can deliver on that uh, insinuation in this session. Uh, but certainly this is the CHE, because the CHE is not the management at the CHE, it's actually the peers uh, in the sector that make up the CHE, that make up its HEQC and that do all the work that result in the publications and the policies and the quality assurance initiatives that come from the CAG. So um, over the last few years, we have seen quite a lot of change in higher education, massive change. Um, not least the COVID-19 pandemic, but also rapid changes in technology, rapid changes in the world of work, um, shifts to online and blended uh, learning, crisis-driven change, that's impacted on higher education, um, uh, uh, electricity, um, water shortages, uh, the big challenges of uh, poverty, inequality, and unemployment continue to impact, um, and then the broader global issues around capitalism, and neoliberalism, and globalization, and the impact that those are having on our higher education. Um, and this does we have seen some internal uh, uh, um, uh, responses to this in higher education, including universities becoming increasingly corporate, corporatized and managerialist in nature, um, alienation of students, staff, communities, um, access and success has been impacted by these bigger changes, We've seen the emergence of things like flexible learning pathways and the idea that a formal qualification is not the only possibility in relation to education and training. We've seen a massive growth in online and blended learning. Um, and even now, latterly, things are still moving. Rapid movement towards the introduction of micro-credentials across the world, including in university spaces, and just now, over at the beginning of this year, artificial intelligence has taken massive leaps. Uh, and large language models like ChatGPT has come to the fore, and something that we're grappling with in higher education as well. So this has resulted in the CHE putting together a project called the Reconceptualizing Learning and Teaching Project, the RELATE project, which essentially is about trying to understand what does all of this mean? for higher education. How is higher education being impacted concretely through all of these rapid changes that are certainly not ending and, and likely to continue? Um, and how do we need to reimagine learning and teaching futures uh, going forward? So uh, it's a meta project. It's comprising of several thematic projects uh, and a number of reports from these uh, thematic projects are starting to become available in the process of being finalized. The idea is to pull all the learnings together to describe what possible futures could be, so to move into a kind of future thinking uh, scenario, in what directions do we collectively want to move, and what steps do we need to take. 
including thinking about the policy changes, the artifacts, um, the structural changes that we need to think about in relation to what's happening. So the two research reports being considered here today are part of this bigger picture. Um, one of them explores the quantitative patterns uh, using the snapshot of these last three years, the quantitative patterns and the changes that you've seen in student success uh, at the national level, uh, and in a further study that explores more qualitatively to try and unpack what are some of the qualitative reasons uh, underpinning what you see uh, in the quantitative patterns. So this is the first opportunity to present this work, these two pieces of work, uh, in a formal setting. Uh, we invite you to engage critically, but constructively <laughs> with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm bringing my laptop with me because I can't see on that screen. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to talk about the quantitative analysis of student success during the pandemic. Uh, the first thing is, and maybe you'll feel better about not achieving your enrollment plans and that you are in trouble with DHET after this presentation. You will see, for example, what the CHC asked me to do is to look from 2018 to 2021. We would have liked to include 2022, but we know the 2022 data will only be available at the end of this year. But I, I just selected a few uh, slides. There's going to be a, quite an extensive report published later. Now, percentage change from year to year means if I look at 2019 compared to 2018, what happened? You can see what's very interesting over this period 2018 to 2019, the only two groups that had an increase in first time entering students was Africans, only, on, only in the year 2019 to 2020, a 14.5% increase, and colored a 3% increase in first time entering students. So in total, if you look at the whole period, there was a decrease of 10% from 2018 to 2019, an increase 2019 to 2020, the COVID year, and then a huge decrease in 2020 to 2021, and then again a huge decrease of 19.5%. This is concerning. Uh, if you look at first time entering undergraduate intake by gender, and I have to speak on behalf of the males. You can see that the females are outperforming us on every level. Even in terms of intakes, you can see in 2018, for example, there was 33%... Sorry, sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. I mean, also can't multitask. <laughs> so, from... In 2018, there was a 33% difference in intake. So 33% more females into the system. And in 2019, also 33%. In 2020, 40%. In 2021, 34%. It's a huge difference. A third more student, female students going into the system. Then, the other thing that we all observed was the percentage change in total enrollments by nationality from year to year. You can see how the international students <coughs> declined in the system. From 2018 to 2019, minus 7.7% international students in the system. The next year, minus 13.1% international students in the system. The next year, minus 7.8%. So in total, over this period, we've lost 26% international enrollments which means it's a quarter of international norms that we had before 2018. This is the percentage change in total enrollments by population group and gender from year to year. Now this is total enormous. The first lot was first time entering students. You can see the only group that did well in terms of, of growth was actually the African females. If you look at the last column, the total percentage change from 2018 to 2021, African females increased by 8.2% in the enrollments from 2018 to 2021. 
The African months declined by 3.3% in total, not per year, in total. So African students, because of the females, increased by 3.5%. Coloreds, the females and the males and the total all declined by minus 8%, minus 13.6%, minus 10%. Indians a lot, minus 18.6% of the females, minus 18.9% less males, and minus 18.7% less males in 2021 than in 2018. And the whites, the biggest declines, females minus 21.4% enrolled in the system, the males minus 23.7%, and in total minus 22%. 2.3%, also almost a quarter. So we can speculate what's happening. Of course, in population numbers are playing a role. We know uh, Indian and white population is declining, but not at such a rate. So a lot of them could go to private institutions, for example, but that needs to be investigated. Uh, then, if we look at institutional types, the annual growth rates in enrollments by institutional type and level. Uh, the year again, I look at the undergraduate postgraduate phenomenon. You can see in traditional universities, this is average annual growth rate. Postgraduate enrollments have been declining at minus 1.9%. In comprehensive universities, minus 0.7%. But in NMU, much more. Universities of Technology had a 5.5% average annual growth rate in postgraduate enrollments. But that's on small numbers, so that's why the, the growth rate looks so high. Uh, distance universities, there's only one, but it was a decline of minus 12.9% on average per annum. In, increased by 0.7%, almost nothing over this period, very small. And postgraduate declined by minus 4.3%. Then success rate by population group and gender. Now if things are green or yellow, they they more to the upper side, but the orange and red is more uh, lower. Uh, we all know, and Francois and then we'll talk about the 2020 success rate phenomenon. I'm not going to go into that, but we had much higher uh, success rates in all institutions in 2020. But if you look overall, let's just look at the last column and the differences uh, Again, you can see the African and colored students are doing worse than the Indian and white students. It's not always not new news to us, but the difference is just quite significant. The, the unnamed group here are just uh, students that are not classified according to population group because there are universities that students don't classify according to population group anymore. So that's that's not those trends you can't really take because it's it's a group that. But if you look at the others, you can clearly again see white Indian do much better than African colored, uh, females do much better than male. This is again success rate by gender. You can see the difference in 2018, a 6% difference between female and males with success rate. And by 2021, the difference was 5%. Returning students by gender, this is uh, the same returning calculation I did for NMU. Uh, the 2018 percentage, 2018 returning in 2019, that means students that should have returned. Um, it's increasing for, for females and males from year to year. From 2019 to 20, it's better. From 2020 to 21, it's better. But again, look at the huge differences again between females and males. So not only are we getting fewer males in the system, they're doing worse and they're dropping out more. They're not returning. Uh, returning students by population group. Again, the, the kind of pattern where the Indian and white students are returning higher percentages of them and lower percentages of African and colored students that return from one year to the next. And lastly, as a result of those changes in the enrollments, you can also see um, the only group that's actually growing in terms of graduates is African students. 
And in each of those years, 2018 to 2021, the females, African females, grew at a much higher percentage, 3.5% on average per annum. The males, 1.2% per annum. And then the coloreds, it was, again, the females had a very small growth on average per annum. In terms of graduates, the Indian and whites, large declines, of course, because of the enrollment patterns, where they also much less in the system and, and decreasing in the system. Thank you. the CHE. So what we looked at is we looked at uh, success literature in South Africa. We did a, a thematic analysis of what has been happening in research on student success. We also went back to two studies that we did. So the SALUM and what's missing there is the SEC-TLF. Um, so the SALUM was a student survey, 49,000 responses during COVID. And then in 2021, we talked to staff about how they see the teaching and learning future after COVID. The, the aim of our work was not so much focused on, on explaining 2020 and why success rates were so high, but finding um, what are the lessons we can learn uh, from uh, the COVID years um, for a digitized uh, new future. So these definitions, the top definition most of you would know, and there won't be a quiz on that, uh, because we're with the CHE and the audit people, so we'll just keep quiet there. Um, if we look at the second paragraph, you can see a huge uh, uh, expansion in terms of what is uh, required of institutions. Um, equity in terms of race, gender, achieving, achieving credible results minimum time to completion, successful entry to employment, or successfully going into postgraduate studies. So there's three constructs there that's important. Uh, the first is uh, throughput, and that we want uh, our students to get there in minimum time. Uh, hence my uh, reaction to, to Marie's data. Uh, how do we think about minimum time if we are producing the next generation of leaders to take the country forward? Is N plus N ideal? N plus one? Equity of outcomes that we've talked about a lot and then navigating the world uh, beyond uh, graduation. So just to, and this is really a high level uh, flyover um, that uh, we're doing because we want you to look forward to uh, report also. So firstly, we looked at diverse theoretical viewpoints on understanding student success. We looked there at the engagement work, we looked at the capabilities approach, um, a critical realism approach. So there's really wonderful work that's been done to think conceptually, linking on to Liesel's question, what do we mean uh, by student success? Um, then Sonia, who was the principal researcher here, therefore all the difficult questions go to her, um, is she, we looked at the, the themes in the literature. And if you can see the diagram there, not really very well, so let me read it for you. So the yellow block there is we see an increase or a theme of cross-institutional interventions in South African scholarship around student success. We saw in the green one academic approaches uh, to student success, the sort of blue one, the co-curricular, extracurricular, there's a lot of research there, and then very fantastically, uh, students' perspectives and their voices in the literature um, that we could see uh, what we looked at. So what are some of the, the key findings uh, that we've seen? So, not surprisingly, you have seen the reports that we've produced, but very important to re-emphasize 
as Murray encouraged us this morning to think about our contribution in shifting the needle, changing um, that very, very troubling um, Gini coefficient or inequality analysis. I don't know, maybe it was not a Gini coefficient. Let me not go to a field where I'm not. Um, so, good pedagogy uh, um, is absolutely vital. Um, we talk about that, we've talked about that with our Achieving the Dream colleagues, but from uh, the COVID experience, transparency, communication, communicating well. Blended learning, if we're going to do that properly and leverage the best of both worlds, we're going to need to train our students and our staff um, in that. Um, there is tremendous potential and there was very positive things that came out of COVID in terms of what technology can do well. Um, but very, very importantly, um, the training of our academics. Um, and I, I, I saw, uh, citing a lot my Northwest colleagues, Emmanuel Kwasha, in beautifully put it in a seminar that we had. We've got a lot of first generation students. We very seldom talk about our first generation academics. And I think that's something which we need to talk about a lot. Digital inequalities, we've talked a lot. Murray reflected on that uh, a lot this morning. I'll emphasize the sort of sub-bullet there, uh, which just emphasizes what we saw. We, we see many more students from quintile one to three. Um, these are students that have overcome phenomenal challenges to get into our institutions. I don't think we have to worry a lot about grit with them. But uh, we have to be very, very good at the support they need to navigate and be successful in um, their studies. We cannot assume that just because they have a high AP that they will um, sail through. Um, I think that would be very, very problematic and that comes through in the qualitative data. Um, the engagement data, oh, I'm skipping fast too forward, oh, forward too fast, sorry. Uh, the engagement data shows um, that less of a quarter of the students, and this is an artifact of, of, of COVID, due to what happened to assessment, we're not seeing application of knowledge. And we have to ask some very deep questions about if we're going to talk about graduate attributes. Right? Uh, graduate attributes need sophisticated uh, teaching and learning to make it happen. So, considerations for planning. Um, Charles showed you the incredible importance of enrollment planning, how uh, we have to focus on that. Our qualitative work talks about uh, policy alignment. It talks about if we're going to do the blended learning thing, we have to have the infrastructure. Uh, students have to have access to data. We need analytics, and hopefully uh, Dr. Green can talk about how the CHE is also thinking about using data in a more sophisticated way, and that we can move things forward, and also uh, leveraging technology uh, to deal with issues around academic integrity, uh, despite the wonderful gifts of ChatGPT. Then financial uh, implications or financial planning, how do we think differently in our system? Uh, about supporting a blended, post-COVID digitized reality. Um, how do we bring in new technologies? Um, the UCDG can play a phenomenal role, role there. That's the University Capacity Development Grant by DIET. Um, do we think differently about infrastructure grants? Um, that we can get our students to participate in innovative pedagogies using technology. We looked at uh, the 16 standards, uh, not necessarily the QAF, it was more the order framework that we looked at. And what you can see there, the same themes coming through. Uh, policy alignment, uh, sophisticated analytics that need to be used, uh, program and curriculum design, an issue that's uh, on many of our minds. Are our programs optimally aligned? Are they optimally registered within the, uh, the infrastructure of uh, the CHE, the DIET, and SACO. Uh, again, you can see the good pedagogical practices, training of staff. Um, we have to focus, our students are central, but we have to have our staff 
uh, empowered uh, to support them. Final reflections, important factors remain as we put initially, throughput equity of outcomes and preparing our students not only for world of work but postgraduate studies and that there needs to be intentionality about that. Quantitative data are fantastic as Charles always does um, in terms of getting, uh, giving us the lay of the land. The qualitative data tells us how. And the qualitative data is all our stories right, that we've just put together. And I think there's a lot, um, as we can see just this morning, that we can learn from each other and to take things forward. Thank you. So my task is to reflect on reflections. <laughs> So it's been really interesting to kind of look at these studies um, and to also um, consider uh, other engagements that uh, have been happening in the sector, including an engagement yesterday with the town fellows uh, in the town session, um, where uh, some of these issues were also being discussed. I think we have to be asking serious questions around why is our enrollment declining? And why is it declining in the patterns that we see? You know? um, what is happening with the males in our higher education system? and particularly African and Canadian males. And this has been a long-standing observation. I mean, when we started our focus on this work, since 2009 already we started to pick that up, and it continued. Um, what, what accounted for the significant spike in success in 2020, despite the huge challenges, despite the condensed uh, academic year? Um, and often the default in answering that question is a compromised uh, academic quality and assessment quality. But there's also been challenges to that notion. You know, the fact that um, people were able to think about other ways to support students during that time. The fact that things like academic exclusions were moved out. Alternative assessment practices that might have been more appreciated by students. So I think we have to take a kind of balanced view when we explore that. But I do think we have to explore it. Um, why are we retaining better over these last three years? Retention was a problem, but retention is going up, even despite the significant challenges uh, that you're seeing in our system. And is that thanks to all the work that you are doing in your various spaces that we're seeing, seeing increased retention? Uh, in our higher education system. It is increasingly becoming evident that we need a more nuanced view of student success. You know, while the data and the quantitative data is really helpful, it, re it really just does the function of pointing us to asking questions. And we have to ask the right questions. Um, and I think um, the shifts that we started to make about thinking of student success more broadly as graduate attributes, as transitions into workplaces and society um, are, 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 are notions that you need to pick up uh, in the student success work uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> equally important to tracking things like throughput rates, um, dropout rate, uh, and so on. Uh, for me, a really important issue that's coming to the fore is epistemic access and success. Right? So it's all very well that we are graduating students, that students are passing, but are they gaining access to the episteme? Are they gaining access to the discipline? Are they being successful at appropriate levels in relation to that? So how do we create a bigger focus going forward on the quality of success, and not just the quantity of success? Um, are graduates successfully achieving the attributes that you set out to develop? So I think one of the things we have to start thinking about is critiquing our support initiatives. So all the work that we're doing, from the standpoint of whether they are positioning the student in a deficit mode, and the student needing to be fixed, and the student needing to be supported, versus the extent to which we're grappling with the notion of our institutions being deficit. And how do we fix our institutions? How do we make our institutions more welcoming, more receptive? How do we consider structure and policy changes? And we saw some ideas coming through in the range of presentations 
uh, early on. At the level of national policy and strategy, you know, so is our national policy and strategy deficit? You know, so it's not just about students and students coming in underprepared or unprepared and needing, needing to fix that. Um, there's a dominance of the resilience narrative that kind of sometimes overtakes our conversation. Um, and and Francis did pick it up just now. You know, the grit, the fact that our students are resilient, that they make a success despite, you know? And I think that's great that that is the case. But you can't stop there. I think we have to ask the question, why 25 years after democracy, certain categories of our students still have to be resilient and still have to have grit? Should we at the national level be revisiting the N, N plus one debate? And we can leave it at the key. Thank you, Dr. Green. And Sonia will take the questions, right? Francois? <laughs> um, just maybe five minutes. Um, Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, really interesting uh, presentation panel. Uh, Charles, just a question to you, I might have missed it. In your data, did you include UNISA um, when you were looking at all those success rates and drop rates, dropout rates and so on? Was UNISA included? Thank you. Yes, it was included. And, and I think this morning in Murray's presentation, it, it became very clear that Yulisa was on a different timeline. But that, those pres that presentation and that data maybe doesn't take into account that Yulisa students are actually meant to be part-time. So, so they were they're just on a different time scale, but one would have to research that and look into it. Okay. Um, Where's the microphone? Oh, okay, like, do you mind if we take that one? Then the path is easier. Thank you. Um, so I don't know if mine is a question or a comment. It's just the insights that were raised at the end. They are forcing us to have conversations that I think we've been avoiding having in terms of contextualization. If the university is a microcosm of society, you need to start asking yourself what is happening with black men in society, what's happening with colored men and so forth in society, and then you'll get the answers of why the, the data looks the way it does, because that's just a reflection of what's happening in general um, in society um, as a patriarchal conservative, because South Africa is still very patriarchal, still very conservative. And now that the tide is turning on that, and you know, women are, you know, there's all these opportunities, and, and we are grabbing them as quickly as we can, especially black women, the flip side is that, um, and it brings a, a, a comment or a quote where, it says, where someone said, equality looks like oppression when you're used to being like at the top. So now that we're leveling the playing field, maybe the men are not used to having to, you know, it, how can I say, having to like work for what they get. As women, have always had to fight for everything, especially black women. So now that level, level, the, the playing field is being leveled, um, maybe the, the boy child is just like, oh, now I actually have to fight and work. And, and I'm not saying that black men don't know how to do it, but they have not had to do it the way that black women or colored women had to do it. So there's a societal, whatever's happening at university is reflecting what's ever happening in what's happening in society. So I think we need to have those conversations and look there, and then that will help us answer even the question, even the question of what. Okay. okay, colleagues, let's have the next question. That, was, that was not a question, by the way. <laughs> okay, I think from a, from a standpoint of uh, earning mobility, because the previous speakers kind of presented on the decline in the females and the, the increase in the males, um, I don't know if I'm quoting that graph correct, but 
For me, I see that as a positive. We, um, when we're talking in terms of the improving enrollment rates amongst females for intergenerational success, based on the, uh, if you look ahead of, our, of the literature, uh, that um, you, we, in terms of addressing the inequality, equality, we do know very well that. Um, in spite of the families that we have in South Africa or that are coming up, that is a positive in the long run. However, that is a very, there's a concern with respect to, to the males that are, are, are not enrolling or the percentages. And I think it's, it's a, we can borrow from the global world or first world countries because it seems this is a global uh, voice if you listen to academics like uh, uh, Professor Jordan Peterson pertaining that. Um, obviously, one can understand that there is something going on. However, what is going to be the impact of that on the society? In spite that, yes, we can celebrate that, but um, we can look at other institutions of the society, like uh, uh, we are in the country where the crime rates are high. If that stats is like that, what is happening then to the male in the society, considering that uh, uh, with, in terms of personality, or rather their behavioral attributes, or if we look into the, our criminal justice system, more men are the ones who are in prison. Obviously, you are able to check what is it that's going to happen uh, to the country that is moving with those states. Lastly, um, on, 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 I think I'm wanting to, to hear from you, because there is, there seem to be a focus on first year enrollment and support, blah, blah, blah. However, first year in honors, you're still a first year, in spite of where you're coming from. Uh, I think the, 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 the student who shared from Nelson Mandela University and about the hardship that you go through. For me, I moved from University of Limpopo to Rhodes and that was a high job. And if there was, there was literally no academic student advisors to catch me. And now that can explain those drops with respect to postgraduate students that are actually just getting out of the way. And there was a presentation of the NS1 student that are sponsored and or most students who are sponsored by NS1 seems to be completing with catching up with students who are actually sponsored privately or by scholarships. But we don't have the same data about national uh, research for NRF for postgraduate students. So it's those dynamics that we have focused only on first year into a higher um, institution, but then we still have different levels. We do know that masters and PhD is high job, degree to honors is a high job, but our support is is yeah seems to be focused somewhere which explain a lot of the stuff that are happening on the data you just shared with us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, he wanted your views, but there wasn't a particular question. Yeah. Can I, can I, no, I think we, we did say that we now need to also start looking, looking more at, at postgraduate post students. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. And, and I know, sorry, can you take the mic to the back there so long, please? I know that Jenny gave me till 20 past. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know who to ask. Um, maybe some reflections and then we close on that. My question is on this slide where you have international students. Um, drastic drop in international students. Um, I'm thinking, have you guys investigated why you have that drastic drop in international students' enrollment? And I must say, hypothetically, that it has a link to the drop in the postgraduate rates, enrollment rates, because um, most of international students come in for postgraduate. So if they are not able to come in to enroll uh, for postgraduates, and you, that's why you see the drop, right, in international students' um, enrollment, then it is affecting 
the drop in the postgraduate rate. So I don't know if, I think it's an interesting um, this thing to investigate what is happening there. I can quickly say that our own experience in our institution was that they had problems, they were not allowed to come into in the, to the country during COVID. And of course COVID uh, caused many economic hardships in countries, making it very difficult for postgraduate students to enroll with the funds that they needed. Okay, thank you very much, colleagues. That is for the student success during the pandemic from the CHE. Um, and we can go to lunch now, I'm assuming. Thank you very much.